Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to the Neurologic Patient Assessment and Advanced Neurologic Tools. My name is Randall Faber. I'm one of the neurosurgical PAs with GNI. I'm Danielle Brown, also one of the neurosurgical PAs with GNI. I'm Ellie Bernardo. I work in the neuro ICU with these guys at Crozier. So we wanted to welcome everyone to our talk. Um, this will be an opportunity for us to go over really the basics of why this is important. It's sort of a fundamental uh, sort of approach to when we take care of neurologic patients. We always really want to stress why the neurologic exam is important, right? I mean, it, it sort of sets uh, the bar for how we're going to take care of these patients. Yeah, uh, we wanted to really stress, uh, for us, this is the main way we know how our patients are doing. Um, we use the physical exam to help guide us in making surgical decisions as well. And so being able to have colleagues and staff who are able to perform a, a proficient neurologic exam um, is key to everyone's success and to patient safety. Definitely. I think we can't understate the importance of this, especially uh, when we're taking care of patients in the hospital. You know, we can't be around uh, our patients 24-7, and so we rely heavily on experienced providers, especially our nurse colleagues, to really um, uh, be the number one advocates for those patients and have a really good sense of what's going on. I mean, we can't understate our, the importance enough of how our ICU nurses really uh, are the boots on the ground 24-7 uh, to give sort of feedback on how patients are doing. I mean, uh, wouldn't you agree, Ellie? Oh, absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm in there constantly. I, you have a whole list of patients you have to see that you see once or twice throughout the day, but I'm in there every hour, um, at least sometimes the whole time. And so I'm gonna see it first, not that you would miss it, just that I'm, I'm your eyes there, and so I'm able to call and let you know if something needs to happen. Yeah, so what we wanted to sort of focus on, especially for this talk, is really about what are the need to knows when we talk about you know, patients that are uh, being evaluated from a neurologic condition? You know, this, this is uh, fundamentally different than what you learn in a textbook for somebody who's doing a neurologic exam. It doesn't really uh, help anyone to sort of go through um, sort of rote memorization of what you should be testing. It's really about what the patient's diagnosis is, how do we tailor their exam to their diagnosis, and really what is the clinical features uh, of the exam that you should be really aware of when you're taking care of patients with that diagnosis. So that's what we're gonna focus on mainly uh, during this talk. Yeah, we wanna guide you on how to perform a thorough but quick exam. Um, as we said, the nurses are going in there numerous times a day. Um, you're much more likely to pick up a subtle change uh, much faster than a provider because you're there more. Um, and so we want you to be able to go in in 30 seconds or 60 seconds, perform an exam and be able to call and say, the strength went from a five to a three, um, I need someone here now. Yeah. And so that's what we're gonna cover today. Awesome. Um, so what we wanted to start with, uh, obviously if we have any questions, we can answer them as we go along. Um, this will be a very interactive opportunity. Um, we wanna tailor this to uh, folks that may not necessarily work every day in a neurologic setting. Um, you know, as let's say you're a, a nurse or a provider on the floor who pay, potentially takes care of med you know, medical patients, general medical floor, maybe you're on a cardiac floor, you know, what's a good neurologic assessment to have in your, in your back pocket? So that's sort of what our focus will be. Um, and obviously tailoring uh, to our stroke scales and to uh, opportunity to go over some clinical cases. Mm -hmm. Um, so for us to start, uh, we we're just going to sort of go through and, and sort of delineate uh, some aspects of the acute neurologic exam that we think are the most important. Um, when we're evaluating patients, we have to think about what is the appropriate exam for that patient, right? Is the patient conscious or are they un unconscious, right? We don't, we're not going to be asking the patient orientation questions if they're intubated and sedated, <laughs> right? So we have to sh uh, know in our mind what exam is gonna be appropriate for that patient. So first that we're gonna sort of talk about are the general considerations, right? Anytime you're evaluating a patient uh, and doing a neurologic assessment, uh, what is their baseline function? Do we know exactly how they were, you know, a day ago, a week ago, um, or an hour ago? These are all important because it potentially can change um, the, the management based on how acute their symptoms may be. Um, you know, obviously, some of the things that we think about when we, when we talk about a patient that's being resuscitated, what's their temperature, their vital signs, are they hypotensive, could all of these things be contributing to why they're neurologically impaired or they're altered? Yeah, uh, 
I think as Randy said, it's really important to have an understanding if there's family or someone at the bedside Definitely. or reports that come from somewhere um, like a nursing home. Uh, knowing what these patients looked like yesterday is, a, is a often overlooked. And so um, to be able to talk to and interview the family at the bedside and find out what baseline function is like is, is so helpful. So if you're the nurse or the provider that's there and family's there, getting the baseline function, home medications, those are things um, that are critically important from the start. Really important. Um, other things that we sort of sometimes overlook are the presence of any intoxicants, drugs, patients may be... Uh, having uh, alcohol on board and maybe we haven't gotten the tox screen yet and they're very early in their resuscitation maybe we were called to go see the patient in the ED um, and uh, that's still pending well they could be under the effects of something so we have to think about this as a global picture uh, rather than just sort of focusing on only the one reason that they came into the hospital um, could they be hypoxic you know maybe they had a prolonged downtime from a cardiac arrest and now um, their neurologic exam is uh, potentially something that uh, is has a is affected from it. So um, these are things that we oftentimes need to sort of go back and think about before we go ahead and dive into why they're potentially altered. Yeah, I think taking a good look at the patient, what, what, is, what do they look like when you enter the room? Do they have any you know, track marks? Are there any uh, signs that there may be some other reason that there is a neurologic change? We get called about this all the time. Um, yeah. And then we get the labs back and you know, alcohol level is 500 and we have our answer. but. All of these nuances, just think outside the box. Think, although it might look like a neurologic change, there are many other things that can contribute to altered mental status. And so make sure you just keep that in the back of your mind. Is their temperature okay? Could they be on drugs? A lot of drug screens don't even pick up some of these new street drugs that are out there. Um, so all things just to consider um, as soon as you enter the room. Definitely. Um, other things that we think about is the medications that we give potentially in the hospital, right? Patients come in, they're sedated, or they, maybe they had rapid sequence intubation, and now they have no motor exam, right? These are things that we ask when we approach the patient. When was the last time they got sedation? What was their pre-hospital sort of care up to this point? Maybe they got, um, uh, uh, you know, rocaronium, vecaronium, one of these medications, and now we don't have a good exam to follow. So those are some things to think about. Uh, initially, we look at uh, electrolyte disturbances, uh, patient's blood gas. These are uh, just some things to, to browse before uh, we have all the information for evaluating these patients. Mm -hmm. So as we move in, sort of, uh, we've approached the patient, we talk about the level of consciousness, right? It's sort of, it's not a static thing, it's, it's more of a dynamic thing. It is constantly changing. Patients can be confused one minute and then be obtunded the next. But really what we want, want to focus on is that as it's a continuum of uh, uh, alertness, so essentially as the patients become more confused, more sleepy or lethargic, you're increasing the amount of stimuli that you need to wake this patient up, right? So mm -hmm. um, if I'm lethargic, maybe I just respond to verbal stimuli, you know, just Mrs. Smith, you know, and, and she wakes up. That, that patient has a good uh, level of consciousness, right? As I have to, sort of more stimuli, if I'm, if I'm uh, more verbal stimuli, and now I have to do tactile stimuli and wake them up, that, then that patient is sort of further along the continuum and is more and more sleepy, more lethargic, and progressive uh, on that scale. Um, it, it, as we sort of go down to lethargy, stupor, and then eventually comatose, we think about um, uh, that a comatose patient, despite all types of stimuli, whether they be verbal, tactile, and then eventually noxious stimuli, we can no longer wake these patients up, right? These patients are comatose, and, and despite every aspect of what we try to do, there's no wakefulness, okay? So when we say that somebody's in a coma, that, that implies a very significant uh, diagnosis. It sort of tells us that there's significant neurologic impairment that's going on that we have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, so level of consciousness, you know, it needs to be addressed regularly as we're doing the neurologic exam um, and sort of followed throughout the patient's course. Yeah, I will say don't be afraid um, really to be a little bit aggressive with this. Um, to know if someone's sleeping or they're lethargic is really important. Um, so if it's three o'clock in the morning and you're not getting the response that you got two hours ago or four hours ago, turn on the lights, get in their face, give them a little bit of stim. Yeah. Um, and it's really important to tell, like, are they just a little bit out of it because they've been in the hospital for a week being woken up, or is there a real change here that we need to act on? Absolutely. You know, we're credited with being not the nicest people in the <laughs> hospital because the way we wake our patients up, but it's really 
we're not we're doing that patient a disservice if we're not mm -hmm. uh, adequately assessing their level of consciousness right mm -hmm. I mean it's just something that we have to do on a regular basis and we don't want to inflict any noxious stimuli on patients but we have to to really get mm -hmm. a sense of what's going on mm -hmm. um, so orientation you know a lot of times when I'm uh, asking the patients, you know, uh, do you know where you are? Do you know um, what today's date is? Um, these are things to ask, ask your patient. Um, you know, oftentimes when we document uh, orientation, we have to evaluate person, place, and time. And I like to throw an event. Do you know why you're in the hospital, right? If you can ask the patient um, sort of abstract thought, if you understand why they're in the hospital, that takes a lot of uh, cognition. And oftentimes patients don't have good insight into why they're actually hospitalized, right? Ellie, I mean, a lot of times mm -hmm. when you're in the hospital, patients, you know, you, you know, Mr. Mr. Jones, you had a stroke, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, they have no- What? Yeah, it's like, it's <laughs> brand new to them. They have no yeah. idea. Um, but it's important. I it's mean, really these important. are, we're going in there and potentially consenting this patient. If they don't know who they are or why yeah. they're here, we certainly shouldn't be using them as someone mm -hmm. to consent for a procedure. So yeah. it's really important that we know kind of the, extent of their insight into what's going on medically um, and, and where they are. And so. you may have checked the boxes, right? They may be oriented times three. Right. They know their name, they know where they are, but they, they definitely have no idea what's going on. So that's really important is to establish your insight. Um, so what about the speech? You know, if I ask you, you know, can you repeat after me, no ifs, ands, or buts? Uh, that's a really good way to assess dysarthria, right? Dysarthria is the definition of slurred speech. We oftentimes We'll use that in, in place of, um, you know, if, if the patient has a facial droop or they have mechanical issues, um, we have to assess if they can uh, speak well. And, and uh, a lot of times it's hard because of the, maybe the first time you're meeting these patients, but does your speech sound normal to you is a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, then patients have a lot of good uh, idea of, no, this sounds abnormal. And so you can say that that patient has dysarthria. Uh, yeah, or ask the that. family at the bedside. I always say, does this sound normal? You know, if, if the wife's sitting there, because um, sometimes I think that it does not sound normal and the family's like, oh, yeah, that's yeah, totally, totally that's fine, fine, totally normal. They don't have their teeth in or something, you know. Yeah, like exactly. Do they have teeth? Or it, most people in the hospital aren't wearing their teeth. All of those things can contribute. Uh, I think also another important point is to be able to distinguish dysarthria from aphasia. Yeah, that's really important. Um, so if, the, if, we, if we sort of split them up and, and, and definition-wise, dysarthria is slurred speech, but I, I'm fully able to communicate, to create language and understand language. Mm -hmm. Whereas when your patients come in with aphasia, aphasia is really uh, the ability to understand language is impaired, right? So it comes in many flavors. Uh, the, the ones that we see most commonly are expressive and receptive aphasias. Right, so if, Ellie, if you're gonna give some examples of expressive aphasias. So you made a good point with saying, no, repeat after me, no ifs, ands, or buts, right? Yeah. And that's a great way to assess for slurring or dysarthria, but it's also a good way to assess for aphasia. Are they able to repeat back? And when they repeat back, are they saying the right words? So it's more of a phrasing problem than an articulation issue. Right, and so that's contrasted you know, with receptive aphasia. Can they uh, understand the in information that's coming to them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, oftentimes it looks like they're like they're yesing you and they're saying exactly what they you know you're telling them oh yeah and it's like oh they totally know what's going on but when you when you uh, ask them you know show me your left thumb and they come up and then they they show you their hand and they're looking at it because they're confused that has that patient has receptive aphasia right mm -hmm. um, I think another important point is when you're examining the patient try not to use any physical cues you go in there and Definitely. say show me your point. thumb show me two fingers they may just mimic what you're doing and may not understand so try not to show them what you want try to just ask them right. um, and complex commands will really help you differentiate if they're understanding or not if you say uh, you know wiggle your toes I, that can be a spontaneous yeah. so squeeze my hand yeah. be very careful with it's reflexive for someone to squeeze your hand when you put something in it letting go um, sticking out their tongue, things that take a little bit uh, more processing, I think are helpful Definitely. to differentiate. And I'll add too, with the, with the mimicking, it's important, like you said, not to go in initially saying, show me two fingers or so forth. But if your yeah. patient's having a really hard time following commands, you're having a hard time getting things out of them, you now notice that they're aphasic, it's okay to then go forward and mimic for 
stroke scale later on. Exactly. Just and add I think that we, in there. <laughs> we, we can't like understate that enough is to really tease out those small differences because yeah. they, you can localize where, you know, lesions may be, you know, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised at how much you can pick up on a neurologic exam just by picking up on their speech, right? Is this mm -hmm. affecting their motor, the speech area that affects, you know, how they create language or how they're actually just talking in self. Yeah. So much different than um, not being able to create the word that you want and just us not being able to understand what they're saying because they're extremely dysarthric and that's a, a very fine difference, but parts of the brain uh, involved are much different. And so you yeah. treat those two things much differently. Um, so one of the things that um, we, you know, scares everybody is the cranial nerve test, right? I mean, it's just like terrifying for everybody to think about, mm -hmm. oh, I have yeah. to go back to anatomy 101 or physiology and remember, but really um, you're doing a lot of it very quickly and it's very easy to do on a regular basis. When we talk about sort of breaking out cranial nerve testing, uh, one and two is very difficult to do on a regular basis, olfactory and optic nerve. Um, one, we're not really doing regularly because, uh, you know, olfaction is difficult in the hospital. There's a lot of smells going on, but <laughs> that, that really the, when you're in an office setting and um, you, you really want to test, we oftentimes will use coffee or something with a uh, strong scent and that alcohol you can identify, alcohol, um, but those are very subtle and not really used routinely. Um, optic nerve, um, so if I'm going to test the optic uh, nerve, if Danielle's my patient, um, what I really want to do is sort of get a sense of what her gross vision is like um, and look at a visual fields, right? So if I'm going to test um, the vision, I'm going to have her look at my nose. We're going to cover one eye, okay? And the patient readily will follow commands and I'll say, can you see two fingers? Yes. Great. How about now? One. Great. And so I'm going to test all of those fields individually and I'm using myself as a control, that my lateral vision is normal, okay? And then we're going to switch and do the same thing. So if I ever look at my nose, how many fingers can you see? Two. Great. And how about now? One. Great. And think of it as a grid, you know, we're using it in a grid model. So grossly, you know, upper, at, uh, lower of each eye. Um, the way we sort of talk about it is sort of temporal and nasal, but you don't have to get that detailed. It's just really about what are the gross fields. And if somebody has a, a large field cut, we can pick up on that on their neurologic exam. Yeah, absolutely. We're looking for big changes here. Um, anything to kind of define exactly the area, they're going to need to go see an ophthalmologist. We just want to know, is there a large portion of their vision that, that's missing? Right. So when we talk about field cuts, you know, we can say the patient has a field cut, but really more correctly, we would say a hemianopsia, right? Mm -hmm. Hemianopsia is, a, is an area of the patient's vision that is impaired. And so you can break it down to a quadrinopsia, which is half of that, but really field cuts are hemianopsias, which are localizing uh, lesions to the back of the brain where our brain processes uh, in our visual cortex, it's using the occipital lobes. So we commonly see with posterior cerebellar artery infarcts, we see patients that have hemianopsias. Um, so three, uh, three, four, and six all control our um, uh, eye movement and we test them together. Um, generally, what we're, what we're trying to look for are subtle signs if patients have uh, one eye that doesn't move or potentially some ptosis. Uh, one of the, 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 uh, the, the lid is not moving properly um, or it's just sort of lag behind. Um, so what I have normally do is, and a lot of times if our patients um, have difficulty seeing or understanding commands, sometimes you can use a big hand and just say, I want you to keep your head nice and still, but just follow my fingers, okay? And then you can sort of grossly check their extraocular motor movements in this direction. Sometimes it's hard to follow a finger, but if you have your hand, it's easy for them to see uh, especially when you're in a, in a hospital room and it's sometimes difficult to focus. So grossly, I want to check and make sure I can do them in all quadrants, sort of in a, in a very like an eye fashion. And then you can test sort of convergence as the eyes move together, bring their eye closer. That's harder to do. And those are more subtle signs, but grossly sort of in all quadrants, like we did uh, visual fields. I don't know if is that, is that the way you're doing uh, mm -hmm. generally speaking? Yeah, I think it's quick, it's easy, and you just tested three cranial nerves in about four seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. exactly. It, it will be, I think, more apparent than you think. Um, if you look at someone straight on, you may not notice a subtle difference, um, but if you're asking them to move their eyes around, you're going to notice if one of the eyes stays central. Right. Um, so it will be, I think, a little easier to tease out than it sounds. Uh, we're not going to ask you, oh, which nerve do you think it is? Yes. Yeah. You know, if you notice their gaze, gaze is disconjugate or one of their eyes isn't moving or one of the lids is, uh, you know, only opening halfway, those are all important findings. Exactly. 
Um, one of the things we also test, uh, it's part of Cranial Nerve 3, but not necessarily grouped together, is our pupillary function. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we're shining a light in their eye, we want to make sure the pupil reacts. And then what is the size of the pupil? How does it look different than the other? A, a, a millimeter difference between pupils is normal. We call that physiologic anisocoria. Uh, anisocoria being the difference of pupillary size. But when it's greater than a millimeter, we start to think, okay, maybe this is pathologic now. Um, especially in patients that are unresponsive. Now, if your one eye is bigger or one pupil is bigger than the other one, that's a, a concerning sign. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, some other the um, test cranial nerve testing, and we have a question. And we'll we'll just finish quickly on our cranial nerve test. Um, in relation to your visual fields and all that testing, are you checking that every hour when you go in the room, or is this something that you're checking once a day when you go in the room? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. Ellie, what do you what do you I do it as part of my full head to toe assessment, um, which we do in the ICU every four hours. Yeah, and, and you saw it's quick, right? We don't we don't have yeah. to spend a lot of time testing this, but um, especially in our neurologic ICU, we're gonna be doing a lot of these very quickly, very rapidly, um, in an effort to see is there anything wrong? Or is the patient had a procedure that we need to really focus on, uh, their eye movements or potentially their vision. And I would say, um, if you're checking anything at all, it would be pupils uh, oh, every yeah. single time you're in the room. And Any uh, changes in the pupils, uh, extremely important. So if you don't mm -hmm. have time to do a whole visual field exam, definitely at least take a look mm -hmm. at the pupils. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, as we move uh, further along in our cranial nerve uh, exam, we look at uh, cranial nerve 7, our facial nerve. It's really uh, important for us to uh, test, um, you know, what is their... Uh, ability to smile, um, ability to sort of, you know, be look surprised, frown, all of these things. Um, one area that everybody gets sort of hung up on is the, the bells versus the stroke, right? I think this oh, yeah. is, even for the, for the best and most astute uh, neurologic provider, it can, it can definitely look and feel like a real stroke. And, and I think we have to sort of go back to understanding what, is, what are we actually seeing here, right? We're looking at a lower motor neuron problem versus an upper motor neuron problem, right? So when we're testing cranial nerve seven, we're asking the patient to smile. What part of the face is affected, right? Is the entire hemi face uh, paralyzed and they can't look surprised, puff out their cheeks, right? I have them raise their eyebrows, puff out your cheeks. Um, you know, if they can't do that for the entire face, we think more peripheral nerve, and that's more of a, a Bell's sort of picture or a Bell's variant that we see. Yeah, hugely <clears throat> important. Um, we see a lot of patients with Bell's get TPA uh, yeah. because it's hard to distinguish between the two. Um, also, make sure you're looking at the eye. A lot of times in Bell's, the eye does not close. Um, yes. And so another kind of subtle finding, if the forehead is not moving, the eye is not closing, definitely would favor a Bell's over a stroke. That's a great point because these patients are coming in, they're tearing a lot because their eye, they can't close their eye and so they have a lot of discomfort there um, and it can give you subtle sort of hints at, okay, what am I dealing with, you know? And um, if, if the patient has a significant or pronounced facial droop, which is what we think of when we think of upper motor neuron, right? That's our stroke uh, lesion, um, but it should really come as a package, right? Generally, stroke patients just don't have facial, a facial yeah. droop alone. Oftentimes they'll have you know, a subtle um, sensory deficit, or you may pick up on a motor deficit that may not have been there before. And so don't just think that a facial droop in and of itself may be entirely stroke. We have to look uh, at the global picture. Absolutely. Um, so in addition, as we move further, further along, uh, cranial nerve 8, a little bit more difficult to test um, for hearing, uh, vestibular cochlear, but you know, in patients that may have had trauma, maybe they have a temporal bone fracture and they may have significant hearing loss on one side, you, know, you, you may find that, oh, you know, is your loved one hard of hearing? Well, no, this is new. We should just pay attention to that. Um, difficult to test in-house, but they really need an audiology exam uh, uh, as an outpatient. Um, Nine and 10 uh, uh, sort of together involve swallowing, your uh, palate elevation. Yeah, so um, important for so our stroke patients. Definitely, <laughs> because you know, it's, it's not necessarily routinely tested, but when we do bedside swallow evals and patients can't swallow, well, this definitely could be referable to this stroke, right? Yeah. So cranial neuropathies involved in swallowing are oftentimes un, unnoticed or untested initially because we're focused on the weakness, we're focused on the speech difficulty, mm -hmm. but the patients can't you know, contain their uh, secretion, they can't tolerate. Yeah. One of the most uh, dangerous, for sure. Really, yeah. really dangerous. 
Um, cranial nerve 11, spinal accessory nerve, we can test those. A lot of times we reserve those for spine patients, but you know, the ability to shrug your shoulders, can you shrug your shoulders? Um, and then we sort of test them individually side by side. Um, you can get some uh, laterality with that. Um, and then 12, cranial nerve 12 is our um, uh, so testing the uh, uh, hypoglossal nerve, right? So that's, can they move their tongue? Um, rare to see a, a um, tongue deviation, but we do see them um, with cranial nerve 12 dysfunction. Um, but that's sort of the cranial nerves for the awake patient, right? Yeah. I think we skipped five also. We skipped, uh, we did skip uh, five. Trigeminal mm -hmm. uh, sensation to the face is broken into uh, three distributions, V1, V2, and V3. Um, in our context, you're really probably seeing trigeminal neuralgia patients, people who have pain in this distribution. Definitely. Um, probably not a lot of acute changes in the hospital, but it's, you know, part of the package. Definitely. Um, rare to see isolated, but like you're saying, trigeminal neuralgia is a, a common complaint. Um, so uh, with the cranial nerve testing, lastly, for the unresponsive patient, we really want special consideration for testing brainstem reflexes. Um, these are encompassed into our cranial nerve tests, but they're ones that we test sort of independently um, to see exactly what uh, brain function the patient may have, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say your patient's intubated, um, they haven't really done any you know, movement, they're not waking, they have like very decreased level of consciousness. Well, what do their brainstem function look like? What do the protective reflexes look like? And what do those exactly sort of consist of? We're testing, obviously pupillary function is important, mm -hmm. But do they have a cough or a gag, right? If they're intubated, you know, um, manipulating the endotracheal tube or putting a suction catheter down can assess whether or not they can cough or have a, a reflex to, you know, having a, a tube in their throat. Um, we, we sort of routinely test those, um, but they're really important to assess whether or not these patients still have brainstem function. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to those, um, we may do some special function. Uh, also with that, I'm sorry, uh, corneal testing. So I, I don't like touching the, the cornea with a glove. If everybody's doing that every hour, you can imagine you can cause a corneal abrasion. Um, so just a little bit of saline, just drop it in their eye. You can, you can get a good sense of what, what's happening and it lubricates their eye as well. So uh, if any of you contact wearers out there, glasses, you, can, you know how stimulating it is to put a drop of something in your eye that's a really good way to elicit a corneal reflex, right? So just drop some saline, take a look, and see if you can elicit a response. Um, from the special test, if the patients have significant impairment and we're thinking about, you know, is the patient progressing to brain death, uh, we have to test for something called cold calorics and doll's eyes, right? These are uh, sort of primitive reflexes that may be impaired in patients that um, are uh, potentially brain dead. And so um, what uh, cold calorics is, instilling a, a, a large volume of cold water into one ear and eliciting if there's a response with nystagmus. Not getting into a lot of details, but generally no response is that, that ap that's absent. Um, and then doll's say, eyes and everything else. Yeah, cold calorics, um, these are kind of advanced. We won't be, you know, no one would be asking you to do this at the bedside, but just kind right. of warnings, never try to attempt these on someone who <laughs> is awake. Um, it will Don't end it. very terribly. Yeah, it makes <laughs> yeah. you very nauseous, yeah. very yeah. dizzy. Um, if unless they're intubated and, and you're getting yeah. close to brain death testing, it's something you don't want to put someone through. Yeah. They won't be happy with you. Not <laughs> nice. Um, and uh, so those, and then doll's eyes, if the patient doesn't have a C-spine injury, you're gonna open their eyes and sort of move their eyes back and forth. Do their eyes move with their head or are they focused on an object? And so in an awake patient, you know, th their eyes would be focused on an object, but if their eyes move like a doll, then they've lost that reflex, okay? Um, so I think we do have a question. Oh. No, oh. no questions? No okay, questions. before we move on to the next. So uh, moving on now more to an awake patient. Um, Strength testing. Uh, this is something I think is uh, very important, but often uh, comes through very differently based on provider. And so there are definitions for each level of strength, and it's really important that you're able to convey those to someone else and that we're all speaking the same language, or I can go in a room, or Ellie can go in a room, or Randy can go in a room, and we're all getting the same thing. Um, because if we're not, it just leads to mass confusion, mm -hmm. and nobody really knows exactly. Um, what, what the baseline is. It's a great point. So strength testing is broken into a scale of zero to five. Um, this too, I test every time I'm going in to see a patient, it takes mm -hmm. me 15 seconds maybe. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a lot. Uh, so five out of five is full strength, meaning 
Um, if you put your hands up to theirs and you have them squeeze your hands and pull towards you, you should have equal strength. Um, you shouldn't see any giving uh, and it should feel about the same uh, for two providers who are, are functioning normally. Four out of five means that they're still able to resist gravity, put their arms up in the air. They're able to still squeeze, um, at, but when you ask them to push or pull you, you might notice one gives more than the other. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some resistance, but it's not full resistance. So that's a four. Three out of five, um, you're able to lift your arms up off the bed, but as soon as I try to come over and, and uh, apply any sort of resistance, the extremity drops to the bed. So that's three. Two, not even able to resist gravity. Um, so a two is someone who's laying in a bed. Um, if you want, to, yeah, exactly. They can move it side to side, but they can't resist gravity. One, uh, really trace movement, uh, very little movement. And zero is no movement at all. So really important uh, mm -hmm. for you to be able to call and, and give us the difference. Um, I thought they were a four before, but now they're a two. Well, that's a huge change. Mm -hmm. You yeah. could give me some resistance um, against gravity, and now you can't give me any. You can't even lift against gravity. So very important to be able to convey what a change like that might, uh, it might look like. Um, for patients who are unresponsive, I think something that's often very difficult is the difference between flexion extension, no response, um, and certainly there's a, a gray area there, um, but the main difference, flexion, um, if you don't mind, just usually requires stimulation, so don't be afraid to get in there. A little <laughs> pinch or a little sternal rub, um, and then you'll see the extremity move in a little bit. Um, it's called decorticate posturing. Think of the core, their arms coming up towards the core, versus extension. Um, extension, I think if you see it once, it, you are not going to miss it again. It's, um, it's pretty pathognomonic when you see it. Um, go ahead if you'd like to demonstrate. Yeah, exactly. Your arms are going out uh, as opposed to in. So flexion mm -hmm. and extension, um, very different. Both are pretty uh, poor uh, prognostic factors, mm -hmm. uh, but important to be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, sensation. In the hospital, we don't have all the fancy tools. Um, typically, we're doing sensation to light touch. Um, can you feel me here? Mm -hmm. I do both sides um, because they may be able to feel you, um, say on the right, but it might be less than on the left. So I'll say, can you feel me touching? Yes, uh, are they the same? If they say no, then you know which side is more, which side is less. I do arms, legs, and also the face. Because we want to test those, the sensory V1, V2, V3. Imagine just like sort of wisping your fingers around. Does that feel the same? Does that feel the same uh, on someone's face? <clears throat> um, balance and coordination. Uh, in the hospital, we're not testing balance. I would say too often, it's often dangerous to get these patients, especially if they're uh, hemiparetic or hemiplegic, up out of the bed. Um, but coordination, cerebellar sense are very important. Um, so. Uh, just seeing uh, if we can do heel uh, to shin testing. Yeah. Just want to make sure his legs were visible. So can you rub your, your heel down and then up and out? That's sort of for cerebellar signs. If somebody has dysmetria, they wouldn't be able to do that. <clears throat> and then finger to nose testing. Um, you have them, uh, you'll put your finger out and you'll have them go mm -hmm. from their nose to your finger. Mm -hmm. So I'll do this with Randy here. Touch my finger, touch mm -hmm. your nose and then you move around. If they have dysmetria... They might, they might put. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. They, they'll miss, they'll go off to the side, or it may take them longer. Um, rapid finger movements is very easy. You can do at the bedside. It's natural yes. for you know whatever handedness you are, if you're right-handed, a little bit faster on that side. Mm -hmm. um, but someone who has a, uh, a deficit, you, you'll be able to tell if one side is slower than the other. And I'll add to that too, just like you're saying with being slower, um, sometimes they'll hit it right where they're supposed to hit it every time with their finger. They'll just kind of wave to get there or it'll be hard for them to get there. And so I kind of have to pay attention on that one. It's subtle. Yeah, yeah, yeah it can be very subtle. Yeah. Um, spinal reflexes, we will check in our spine patients and we have a case later that will go a little more in uh, depth. Um, but typically you can check biceps, triceps, brachioradialis in the arm. Uh, patellar Achilles in the foot. Um, that's a spinal mediated reflex. So mm -hmm. um, something to keep in mind, especially in your uh, spinal cord injured patients. Um, the reflexive movement 
comes from the spine. And so it can be oftentimes uh, kind of disturbing to the family when you tell someone that their loved one is paralyzed and then they see a reflexive movement. Um, so something we'll cover a little bit more um, in our case, but something we can be checking. Um, and then finally, as we move into more of um, kind of the scales that we're using, I just wanted to touch on uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, we want to talk in numbers that we can all, um, you know, a scale that everyone's familiar with. And so it's really helpful if you say, uh, you know, Mr. Smith came in as GCS is 15 or Mr. Smith came in as GCS is 4. Um, those who are familiar with GCS know what that means, but it's a scale rated on uh, best alertness, uh, verbal response, and motor response, um, graded on uh, 4, 5, and 6 scale, uh, respectively. Uh, I think the important things here, best score you can get is a 15. Um, that's a totally normal, intact, oriented person. Worst score you can get is a 3, mm -hmm. basically the same as a rock. So <laughs> 0 is not a score, 3 is the worst. Um, kind of the decider and in intubation level of alertness is about an eight. If someone's an eight or less, you really need to th start thinking about their airway. Um, so just numbers to be aware of. You'll see uh, largely uh, in trauma, uh, GCS is, is in every single patient. So important to be aware. And I think with the GCS, you know, we can communicate each other uh, what the GCS is, but really it doesn't give us a full picture on what's happening with stroke patients. You know, it's, it is appropriate in, in, in certain instances, but really we want to know what their neurologic exam is, right? The GCS is a, a quick overview of that, but it doesn't give you the full story. Absolutely. So we do have a couple questions that we will take before we move on to the stroke scale. So first question, would you test brainstem reflexes on an awake patient? Um, so it, in wake, wake, a wakeful patient, oftentimes the brainstem reflexes are not tested because though we have to assume that they're intact. But, um, you know, it is because they're very stimulating, right? You're not going to put something in someone's throat or um, because we have to assume that they're present. They, yeah. uh, really, when we're testing brainstem reflexes, we have to, we're assuming that a lot of the function, cortical function, subcortical function is impaired in these patients. And so if we have none of that function, meaning their motor response is poor, their eye opening is poor, then we have to move sort of from a, a, a very rostral all the way down to mm -hmm. someone who potentially only has these left is that that's the real reason that yeah. we're testing them yeah someone it's more who's do awake. they still have them exactly yeah <laughs> they're exactly. awake they're blinking they're eating they're you know clearing their throat we can assume that their brainstem reflexes are yeah great intact. question though absolutely mm -hmm. now the second one we might need a little more clarification just spasticity versus rigidity yeah, so uh, spasticity, um, having a spastic um, response is generally a muscle uh, that is very tense. It's sort of um, constantly being innervated where we see in patients with upper motor neuron dysfunction. Um, being spastic could be related to a brain uh, dysfunction or um, a uh, spinal cord mediated uh, dysfunction. But really, it, it sort of goes back to what is the pathology? What are we looking at in terms of what we think the patient may have? Um, we sort of couple that with their, the tone of, you know, their tone is very elevated and the bulk uh, of their muscles, or are, are they losing uh, uh, muscle strength, um, is really what we think of when we think of sort of spasticity. Um, and a rigid, uh, rigidity is sort of something similar, but usually that means that their, their um, arm or their joint is sort of locked in place. And that may have occurred over time. It also may be referable to different neurologic conditions. <clears throat> It looks like the question is um, a little more specific. How do you test strength on someone who's either spastic or rigid, I would guess? That's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, patients still a lot of times will maintain some semblance of strength, but it may impair your ability to accurately assess their strength, right? If, they're, if their arm or leg is, is, is in stuck in one position, um, especially if they have a spinal cord injury, they may actually have motor function, but the muscle is so tense that you may uh, uh, not have an ability to sort of figure it out. And so indicating that, you know, maybe this is confounding that or inaccurate is appropriate, uh, an ability to test it because of there's so much spasticity. Mm -hmm. All right. And just one more. Yeah. Um, when you check your pupillary size and response, do you turn the lights in the room off or do you leave them on? That's a great question. What do you normally do, Ellie? Uh, it depends on how easy they are to see. Sometimes with the lights on, it's not really a problem. You shine a bright light in their eyes, you're going to see a reaction, you're going to see the size. And sometimes, um, and usually if they're 
too brisk. <laughs> you can't see the reaction. You have to turn the lights off um, just so you can see the reaction a little bit better, get the pupils larger to assess them. Yeah. I think being consistent is important. If you're going to test their pupils, just turn the lights off all the time. Just mm -hmm. do it for every check that you're doing, especially if you're um, checking the patient routinely. For us, we do it routinely. It's just easier and it takes sort of additional yeah. uh, elements out. Uh, it, the, pupil the pupillary size changes more when it's dark to mm -hmm. light than yeah. light to lighter. And so especially when you're new to this, I think it'd be helpful to probably turn the lights off. Yep. Keep, them, keep things constant you know, uh, and controlled for when you're actually trying to get a good neurologic assessment. All right, I think we're going to move now to the uh, NIH stroke scale. All right, so we're going to put this up for you guys so you can kind of see it as I'm talking through this. Um, I'm going to kind of assume that you don't know much about it, so this might be extremely redundant for some of you, um, and I apologize for that, but I'm going to try to give you some tips along the way of things that you can do um, when you have a difficult patient, when you have an aphasic patient. Yeah. Um, they're not following commands, they are ornery, all these sorts of things, right? What do you do when that happens? So some of these we've talked about already with our neurologic exam, right? Level of consciousness. This is something that you're gonna assess when you walk in the room, when you say good morning to the patient. Did they wake right up and start talking to you? Or are you kind of having to arouse them a little bit? Um, it's listed for you right next to the number exactly what to chart. I think the difficult thing is when um, comatose versus a repeated stimulation patient. And the hint that I'll give you here is localization. So we were talking a little bit about the GCS, um, about decorticate and decerebrate and things like that. When it comes to withdrawal versus localization, you sort of want to imagine, an imagine uh, a line down the center of your body. And if you were to, let's say, pinch somebody on, the, on their left arm, is their right arm able to get across that middle center of their body to reach across to get to that left side? That's what localization means. Not only do they know where you're pinching, they're not just pulling away from it, they're reaching across their body to get to you. So if your patient can still localize, even if they're not opening their eyes and they're not following your commands, they're not a three yet, they're not comatose yet. Um, so that's what I'll, that's what I'll say there. Um, as far as level of consciousness questions, when we're there first thing in the morning and then throughout the day, um, we're used to asking these orientation questions, right? Where are you? What month is it? Things like that. Um, and it up, all the way includes up to situation. For the NIHSS, however, while we want to know all of these things as part of our neurological assessment, we want to make sure two of those questions include what month is it right now? and how old are you? And the reasoning is um, those are the only two that you're gonna score for this scale itself, okay? Um, it, it doesn't feel right, it's very unnatural. We're used to asking for things. Uh, it's the way that it was designed. So it's what month is it and how old are you are the only two questions that count for this. Um, and then it'll tell you, you know, one question correctly, two questions correctly. It's not an average. Um, Following commands, we ask them to close their eyes very tightly and open them wide. The reason we use that as one of our commands is this is gonna help us later on in facial palsy to assess whether it goes all the way up to the eye. So we're kind of able to do two things at once here. And the other thing, like Danielle was saying, when you ask somebody to squeeze your hands shut, that's not the command. The command is then opening their hands. That's the command portion of it. Because like she said, when you put your hand in somebody else's hand, it's a reflex to squeeze. You see it all the time with babies. Um, and again, that's really hard for family members to see. You're telling me that they can't move purposefully, but their hand just squeezed open. And so you wanna make sure you have them open their hand as their second task. Um, best gaze we talked about, we talked about um, Mostly though, the extraocular movements, right? So you're going in diagonal, you're going up, you're going down, right? For best gaze, it's just side to side. Uh, so make sure you get that in there when you're doing your exam. Um, can they go one side versus the other? It's only horizontal. Um, when your patient is not answering your questions, not following your commands, doesn't want to do what you want to do. Um, you kind of have to warn them ahead of time because you're going to have to put your hands on their face. Um, and he was talking about the doll's eye maneuver. We're essentially going to do the doll's eye maneuver, even though we're not testing brainstem or anything like that. You're going to hold their eyes open and turn their head to either side, slightly briskly, but not breaking their neck. 
Um, and if their eyes are staying fixed on you, which they should, right, that'll tell you can they go to the, if you do it on yourself, right, look at the light on, on your ceiling and turn your head to the left, your eyes stayed on that light, right, and you could feel that your eyes can go to the right and then turn your head the other way, your eyes can go to the left, right, so they're able to go both sides, they have a normal gaze. Visual fields, uh, he was talking about our, our sort of four square here with our hemanopsia, right, so this is really, really difficult for people to score, and I don't know why. It was, used to be really difficult for me to score, too. Um, the easiest way, well, yes, our center field of vision is intact, so it's not entirely a four square. We're just going to pretend that it is. Um, if one of your squares is out, right, they can't see in that portion, then that's a one, right? Imagine it's, it's out of a four, even though it's out of three. If two of the squares are out, then it's a two. If three or more are out, it's a three, right? Now, in the NIH, it's very, very annoying, but it is the way that it is. We score for baseline, right? So we were talking, let's, um, for instance, slurring. Does their speech sound normal to you? Okay, well, it didn't sound normal to me. Maybe they had an old stroke, maybe they're slurring, so on and so forth. Regardless, for the NIHSS itself, if they're slurring, they're slurring, even if it's how they sounded at home. And the reason that you do that is, let's say you're signing off with the nurse coming on, we, it could get missed that this patient has this baseline slurring. Or, you know, maybe it did get worse or maybe it did get better and, and things like that. So the thought process is when I sign out to you in the morning and another shift comes in that night and it's not me, um, we're going to get the same score regardless. There is no miscommunication. There's no error in that. So that's sort of the thought process. I, I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. Okay. <laughs> so with visual fields, this is the only exception being that because it's hemanopsia, it's not um, central vision and things like that. Your right eye, if it's from the stroke, is going to be the same as your left eye. And that's why we test them one at a time, right? So if one eye is blind at baseline, glaucoma, cataracts, so on and so forth, you, the and National Institute of Health says we're allowed to just test the one good eye because if that had a problem, then the right eye would have had it too, if that makes sense. Um, the other thing I'll say here is they've built in um, sort of a cheat if your patient has neglect. We all know what neglect is, right? You neglect one side of your body or you neglect the other side of the body. When you have a patient who has neglect, you can imagine, let's say I, I forget one side of my body exists, I'm not gonna move that side, I'm not gonna look at that side, I'm not gonna feel that side. All of a sudden, you can kinda count up in your head just by looking at this NIH how many points they're gonna get, right, just for that one thing. So they've sort of built in and they only do it in visual. I don't know why, but they, they do. Regardless of what they get for your visual score, if you find throughout your test that they have neglect, you're gonna change that score to a one. And this is something that I learned recently, um, and uh, I was glad that I learned it because it does help, and it kind of counteracts a little bit that score that they're going to get. Facial palsy, um, you're not going to really be able to see my face here, but I'll sort of show you when we're, when we're doing an example. Uh, you score it based out of a three. Oh, you can see me now. Okay. <laughs> um, so a one is just the nasolabial fold flattening, right? That's that little crease on the side of your face, okay? If just that is flat and you barely notice a facial droop, it's just a one. Sometimes they can even correct it, right? You'll just see it at rest, but they smile big enough and they're happy enough. They're almost correcting it, so you're not sure if it's there. That's your one. A two means the whole bottom of their face is, is flaccid, right? They're not able to lift. They're not able to puff out their cheeks. When they do, it kind of pops right through, right? And then a three, we're talking about lifting your eye, uh, closing your eyes shut, opening them wide. You know, are they able to lift up their eyebrows? If it goes all the way up to their eye, it's your three, okay? So that kind of makes it a little bit easier to score if you think about it that way. Think about your hand. That's great. Um, all right, back to drift. This is the one that gets everybody upset. <laughs> um, it's very different than muscle strength. Muscle strength was on a zero to five. This is a zero to four, and it's the opposite, right? The higher score you get, the weaker you are. Um, and in addition to that, it's only based on purposeful movement, okay? I'm gonna say that again. It's only purposeful movement. If you are comatose in the bed, if you got a three, you are not localizing, 
All I can do is pinch you and withdraw. Okay, yeah, your muscle strength is so on and so forth, but you get a four for drift no matter what, okay? If I can't say to you, lift your arm off the bed or hold your arm up for you and you hold your arm up off the bed, then you have no purposeful movement. I wish it said that in your, see how it just says no movement? I wish it said purposeful right in there, um, but it doesn't. The other thing is, just like I was saying earlier, you're gonna score for baseline. So if your patient had an orthopedic procedure and they can't get their leg off the bed or they can a little bit, but that's all, you have to remember if they can't do it at 7 a.m., they're not gonna be able to do it at 7 p.m. when you leave for the night. Or you know when, when Randy's in there on Tuesday and then Danielle's on there on Wednesday, they're gonna get the same exam, okay? So that's the reasoning behind that. So they're gonna get a pretty high score for baseline things and we just sort of have to accept that. Our job as nurses is not necessarily to assess whether the patient had a stroke or where they had the stroke, right? We're looking at, is there a change? Do I need to call, all right? Are they getting worse? Um, we like to know also if they're getting better, right? Um, but it's, it's not an assessment, it's not an MRI. You're not giving somebody points or a, or a bad grade in a big red letters, okay? It's just a number and just think about it that way. Um, for patients who are aphasic, um, you are gonna have to hold up their arm and you are gonna have to mimic for them to remind them to keep it up. Um, and, and they're usually able to do that pretty well for you. If you just keep putting it back up, <laughs> they'll get the picture. Um, and then you can sort of count down for them. Um, I don't think I'm forgetting anything on that one. I'm gonna move on to ataxia. We were talking about uncoordination, right? Your finger to nose and your, your heels on the shin. Uh, when you're testing for ataxia in the upper extremities, just make sure that your arms are extended fully when they reach out and they, they touch your finger and touch the nose. The reason being your arm can sort of um, brace itself against your body, right? And so if it does have weakness or uncoordination, you're gonna see that. I mean, your eyes are open. And so it's our body's natural response to correct that and to make it better. Um, and so just if you notice that their, their elbow is sort of kinked when you're going and you touch uh, the finger, just kind of take a step back and allow them to fully extend. Um, the other thing on this is that it's out of proportion to weakness, right? So if they have um, difficulty purposefully moving with their drift, with their arms or with their legs, uh, you're gonna, Keep in mind that extremity, if it's very weak, you're not going to score it for uncoordination because you already know that it's really weak, okay? So they're weak, not uncoordinated. So this isn't untestable or anything like that. They're going to get a zero in that extremity that's weak, and you're going to continue to test the other extremities that are strong. Um, I will say though, if somebody only has a drift of like a one, if it's, if it's very minute, you, you know, you're holding your arm up for 10 seconds, it drifts down a little bit, it never heads the bed. I would still test that extremity because you can always have um, coordination issues on top of it. Maybe they had a, a stroke in the past, so they have coordination problems now and they had weakness problems before. Um, so you don't wanna um, miss that. Right, so if it's grossly uncoordinated and they only had a drift of a one, you're still gonna score for it, if that makes sense. Um, and then the other extremities would be the lower, right? So you're gonna do heels on the shin up and down. Sensory loss. If your patient is in a coma, um, our natural ICU response is, well, I'm pinching them and their heart rate went up. They can feel me. I understand, I get it, um, I'm right there with you, but my opinion doesn't matter to the NIH. If they ha are in a coma, they get a sensory score of a two. Um, two would be that they have a severe or total sensory loss. The re their reasoning behind it is that um, they're not aware of you touching them because they're in a coma. I'm just gonna leave that there. <laughs> Zero would be no sensory loss, right? Um, Best language, this is where we show people a picture. We say, describe to me what's going on in this picture. Um, tell me what these objects are, and then repeat after me. You can imagine if your patient's blind, they're not gonna be able to show you a picture, right? And then it's our natural inclination. Well, there goes the whole NIH, because I can't test it, right? So what you can do in that um, 
moment, we have, we're in a hospital, so there's lots of things at the bedside, right? They've got their cup, they've got their phone, they maybe have a pen sometimes, um, or their call bell or things like that, to have them touch a blanket. Put them in their hand and ask them to tell you what they are. Um, when you're asking their orientation questions to situation, you heard them tell the story of how they came to the hospital, why they're in the hospital. So you can hear their fluency of speech. That's an aphasia or a phrasing question. Um, and then those fun questions, those repeat after me, say mama, tip top, that's a repeat after me. That's not a read off the page. And so they're still able to do that. Um, repeating back is a way to test for a language issue. Um, so not everybody is aware of that. So you can have them repeat back. Um, and that's going into that, when you're repeating back, that's your articulation as well. You're testing two things at once. Are they having slurring? How bad is it? As far as the best language for your comatose patient, you see number three, it says mute or global aphasia. If your patient is intubated, and not speaking to you and not alert and looking at you and so forth, they're gonna get a three. Uh, very rarely you're gonna have a patient who is alert, maybe we're weaning them off the ventilator um, and, and they're able to nod yes and no and things like that. They're gonna score a lower score. Uh, it's a, I believe it's a one actually uh, that they're gonna get. So it's the little nuances of it. My best recommendation would be to get either a little um, pamphlet or a printout and just keep it in your pocket. If you are somebody that's either doing NIHs frequently or even if you're a med surge nurse and maybe you've had to call a stroke alert before and you sort of panicked while you waited for the neurologist and the <laughs> ICU nurse to get there, I don't know how to do this confidently, you know. That's something that you can have with you and whip out for that rare occasion. So you do know how to accurately score it and you do know what the questions are. And you know, maybe you'll hear me talk about this and then you don't have to do it again for two years. Um, so just keep it with you. Um, that's how I learned. That's how most of us learned. Um, and just like I, I learned this visual trick for neglect just this year, um, you're still gonna be learning um, all the time. So, Dysarthria, um, if they have mild to moderate um, articulation issues, they're going to get a 1. If they're going to have severe dysarthria, it's going to be a 10. Also, it, I, sorry, I just looked at the number. It's going to be a 2. If they're mute, um, if they're intubated, they're also going to get a 2. Okay. Um, extinction and neglect, this is whether they're acknowledging one side of the body versus the other. Um, I think that's, that's pretty pronounced. Um, and pretty obvious when you do see it finally for the first time. It's always one of those things, well, how do I test for it? How do I know it's gonna be a real thing? As you're going through your tests, my biggest recommendation is to walk around the room um, as you're testing. It kind of helps you do two things. One, if your patient's not following your commands, you're gonna see whether their eyes can go to the right and to the left, right? If you're walking from one side of the room to the other. They're gonna, sometimes you'll walk around right to the left side and they just stop following you and stop answering your questions and forget that you're there anymore. And then you sort of walk back across their midline and all of a sudden they're like, oh, you came back. And I'm like, I was right there, right? Mm -hmm. That's neglect. The first time that you see that, you're gonna know exactly what it is. Um, and then we're just remember to go back to the visual field and change that score to one, give them a little, um, little something for that. Um, I'm going to pause here and see if I have any questions to Thank see if, if I forgot something important. Yeah, you guys do have a couple of questions. That's so all right. First Hit me. one um, is in regards to testing localization, would yeah. you test on the lower extremities and what would that look like? Would I test on the lower extremities? I guess you could. Um, are you thinking if the patient's weak on the upper? I think it's hard, sort of like when we, when we sort of talk about localizing for lower extremities, it's hard to say if somebody can localize, but really are they purposeful in the lower extremities, sort yeah. of spontaneous? That's really helpful to sort of understand. Mm -hmm. It's hard to sort of find a stimulus and then remove it. That's really mm -hmm. what definition of localization is. Mm -hmm. So for the lower extremities, if you sort of give them like tickle their foot or then they'll actually remove their, uh, their leg or just be very purposeful. Those are sort of synonymous with localization. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the next one that maybe you could elaborate on too is just kind of the fact that the NIH is poor at picking up a posterior stroke. 100%. Sure. Trying not to talk about how much <laughs> I dislike it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, posterior fossa strokes and posterior circulation strokes, what we refer to those as uh, for those of you who aren't aware, are strokes within the brainstem or vertebrobasilar uh, strokes that affect those areas. Um, really, these patients look like they're comatose or they may just feel dizzy, they may want to throw up. It's hard to really assess and there's nothing on there. And we agree with you, it's, it's not a sensitive test for picking up a uh, posterior circulation stroke. And so really what we try and stress is having the suspicion that it could be mm -hmm. is, is uh, really going to put you in a good place to make the diagnosis. Yeah, it's a screening tool and n mm -hmm. none of these stroke screening tools are, are you know, foolproof. And so we just, That's a good and point. as, as mm -hmm. Ellie has been saying, it's important that we are able to assign a number, but more important that two people are able to reproduce the same number or similar number because what's the use of the number if we can't determine when it's changed? And so. Yeah. Um, it's really important. We know this is subjective. Uh, people get very frustrated with this scale because of that. But really, we want to assign a number. We can communicate, oh, five, not so bad, 25, bad. Everyone can kind of get a feeling of where the patient is before they even, before I look at a patient, if their stroke scale is 25, I know I, they're not, I'm not going to walk in there. They're going to be walking around the room. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's important that you're doing the scale together. Um, when there's change of shift, neuro changes, uh, you know, are very popular at the change of shift. <laughs> um, it's because of these nuances and mm -hmm. why I gave a three and I gave a one and now my, my scale has changed. And so it's important that as, as a nurse, especially when you're handing off to the next nurse, you should be examining that patient together, um, mm -hmm. agreeing on a number or disagreeing on a number. That's okay, mm -hmm. but the important part is, well, I thought that was a three and I think it's a two. That's fine. But um, yeah, we're looking at but the we know that together and that's changed. the same droop. Yes. So we're good. <laughs> the patient has not changed. And so small changes in the stroke scale aren't uh, a big deal, but a big change is a big deal. Definitely. And that's kind of what we're looking for here. If someone goes from moving their arm to being plegic, the scale is going to go up. And so it's just important to remember, I know that it's frustrating, um, but making sure you're doing it with your colleagues, especially in nursing, um, and just making sure you're looking at the patient. It's about mm -hmm. the patient. It's not about the number. It's not about mm -hmm. the scale, but they're just tools to help us. So make sure you're communicating with whoever you're getting handoff from and you're looking at the patient and knowing if there's really a change or you guys are maybe just, you know, looking at the numbers a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so the next one is when a patient has a baseline deficit that gives them a higher NIH, do you add a caveat new as to what their scale is at their baseline versus what it is now? Um, it's usually documented somewhere that they have this um, baseline, uh, whatever it could be, weakness or things like that. And so I don't necessarily make up an NIH and just sort of put it in and say, well, their baseline is seven. Um, you could go back and look at their discharge instructions. It'll say in there what their baseline is. Um, but a lot of times in my neuro um, assessment or my neuro note that I do in addition to the NIH, I'll just, I'll put in there somewhere that, you know, they have dense sensation to their left lower extremity because of whatever from the baseline. Um, but it's, again, we're not using it as a treatment. We're not using it as a diagnosis as nurses, right? This is um, more looking for, is there a change or is something happening right now mm -hmm. um, and that I need to call the, the physician about. So because we don't have to make decisions on it like that, it's not as necessary that that's written exactly where the NIH is. Good question. Um, it looks like just two more. So how do you differentiate dizziness due to a stroke versus dizziness due to a vestibular dysfunction like BPPV Ooh. or Meniere's disease? That's I mean, to say that very difficult. Yeah. Uh, I, I would uh, lean on our you know neurology colleagues um, who sort of see patients that have benign diseases like vertigo, like BPV, um, or patients with recurrent symptoms. Also. Um, trying to understand the acuity, have they had symptoms like this before? Is this a new symptom? They, you know, generally even patients experience vertigo, or do they have tinnitus? Is this, you know, characterized as something that may be new? Uh, may help you sort of, is this an acute stroke process, or is this something else? Um, it's very difficult, I have to yeah, agree. It's difficult, and yeah. that's why we have advanced imaging. Yeah. Um, but 
I think some key fe features of vertigo um, with change in position, you might have a room spinning sensation, um, that sort of thing, or they'll say, oh, this has happened to me three times in the past and it feels the same every time. Yeah. But largely, it is hard to distinguish without any image or other advanced mm -hmm. um, intervention. Um, and so some, sometimes people get MRIs in the ER just for this, just to make sure. Because worst case scenario, you're having a brainstem stroke, and otherwise it could just be benign vertigo. And so it's yeah. challenging for sure. It's definitely one of the gray areas. Um, makes people kind of nervous because mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to differentiate. Mm -hmm. And reach out for help. I mean, we do it all the time. You know, it, consulting someone who's more knowledgeable in this than you is, is what we sort of rely on. And if there's an area that, you know, I'm kind of confused about this or their diagnosis, I may be suspicious for other things, ask the experts. You know, it, it may be helpful. Yeah, neurology, ENT, physical therapy is great. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, how would you approach a patient that's coming in with only sensory symptoms in an arm or a leg? So that's a great question. That a in lot of times a be, arm or a leg. An arm or a leg. Yeah, just one, not both. Yeah. Um, usually pretty low on the NIH, right? If they're if they're pure mm -hmm. sensory. Um, generally, when it's, it avoids motor, sensory, speech, all these things, we don't think of being a large territory stroke or something that may have a large occlusion somewhere. Those may be referable to lacunar strokes, um, small vessel disease, and so the treatment may be very different. You know, we're not calling the entire team to come in and potentially do a procedure on someone with a very low NIH with a, just a pure sensory deficit. Yeah, I would say also um, you have to keep other things in your differential. If my I come in and say my right arm is numb, well, is it in you know a specific distribution? Could it be coming from my neck? Is there a peripheral nerve that could be involved? Is it the whole arm, part yeah. of the arm? Um, all of those things. Is the face involved? That's a mm -hmm. great way. Um, it's pretty odd to have just a sensory loss in one extremity with no facial involvement. Yeah. Um, so all things I would look for uh, to try and differentiate where is this lesion, you know, where is it coming from? Is this benign? They, you know, hit a <clears throat> peripheral nerve, they bang their arm, or is this something that, you know, is a warning sign for a stroke? And if it's may not like be readily, you know, uh, overly disabling, you have some time to work this up. You know, the relative acuity, if their symptoms are, you know, their, their, their symptom severity is low, just as a sensory deficit, that's not a disabling feature outright of somebody with a diagnosis of stroke. And so oftentimes their workup may be over 12, 24, 36 hours until we kind of come to a diagnosis, but exclude some of the life-threatening things. Yeah, my exam may change a little bit. I might test muscle groups. I might test sensation a little bit differently, reflexes, all things that could help point me in another direction too. Yeah. I actually have one more that popped up that I think is good to answer because it's a question that Bring I think on. you get from a lot of uh, nurses that maybe don't take care of neuro patients a lot too. Um, are you doing an NIH assessment for stroke patients only or also patients that had maybe an elective brain surgery or a tumor resection? Um, so you're going to do a neuro, neuro assessment on all of your patients, right? But the full NIH stroke scale was specifically designed for stroke. So that's something that you're going to do as a handoff with another nurse um, at the start of your shift for only your stroke patients, right? So your ischemic, your hemorrhagic, your TIAs. Yeah, good question. Good. Yep. Um, I will hit on before we continue for ataxia. Um, if your patient is blind and they're not able to do um, the finger to nose movement, it's a, a self-awareness thing that we all know where our nose is, right? So if you pull their arm out and tell them to just do a pointer finger and ask them to touch their nose, they're going to be able to do it perfectly. Um, so if they miss at all, that is going to be a coordination issue. Awesome. Good yeah. tips. Yeah. I think before we move on to the patient case, we did just want to mention um, the MEND exam. Yeah. And some uh, other uh, workshops that we have that can help you, um, you know, with your stroke diagnosing. So one of the uh, courses that we offer and we've been teaching and sort of increasing in its popularity is the is Advanced Stroke Life Support course. Um, from the University of Miami is a peer-reviewed um, sort of evidence-based uh, opportunity for a, a different type of scale, a rapid scale that will allow you to evaluate your patients similar to a GCS, right? We sort of do GCS reflexively in patients and we document them. But the MEND has components of the NIH that are more honed in on major stroke deficits. And, mm -hmm. and really, as you can see here, it's sort of broken down between mental status, cranial nerve testing, and limbs, focusing on really the key aspects. Are they abnormal or normal? Um, and then really, can you localize the lesion from 
uh, the MEND exam? And we found that uh, when we teach these classes, the answer is yes. You know, a lot of times we teach stroke syndrome solely based on what their MEND uh, exam is like. Yeah, you'll see EMS uses the MEND uh, exam a little more frequently. They certainly have a lot more going on, a lot less time to get into the details of a stroke scale while they're bringing the patient to the, to the hospital. So you might hear them communicate in these terms as well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the difference isn't even necessarily the scoring. You'll notice that right away. It says check if abnormal. And so the, what's quicker isn't even necessarily the charting aspect of it, but how they test. Um, it's just, it's much less laborious. You're not, um, for instance, when you test arms, you're not doing one at a time, right? You're doing them at, at the same time. Um, so it's just able to see the same sort of thing in a much shorter period of time. So if you haven't heard of it, it's a great uh, addition to scales that all providers can use. Um, and we've uh, been teaching it through our courses, so you can learn more um, if you visit the ASLS website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another helpful certification is the ENLS. Um, it's available through the Neurocritical Care Society. Uh, it's, it's an advanced neurological life support class. Um, very comprehensive. It goes through many chapters of different uh, kind of algorithms of what to do for patients with neurologic problems or injuries. Um, I find it very helpful. We actually have all of our staff completed. So something if you're looking to have more information um, and get certified, you can get CMEs, um, something you should you know, also take a look at. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think we'll move on to sort of do some cases. <clears throat> yeah, so we're going to move to our first case. So we've discussed the stroke scale, um, and now we're going to put that uh, instruction uh, into a real life patient. And so Ellie is going to examine Randy here, and our first patient, um, a 58 year old male who comes into the emergency department um, with a new onset facial droop with left sided weakness. This started about six hours ago. He was outside mowing the lawn. His wife noticed it, um, thought the weakness was getting worse, and his slurred speech was getting worse. So she calls 911. Um, and uh, Randy comes into the emergency department. Uh, EMS tells us, uh, per his wife, uh, he has atrial fibrillation. He takes aspirin, hypertension, um, some orthopedic surgery, uh, no other major surgeries. He takes some blood pressure medications at home, uh, lisinopril and HCTZ, and uh, he has no allergies that she knows of. So he comes in initially, you can look at his vital signs, blood pressure is 166 over 85, heart rate's irregular, 67, respiratory rate is 12, satting 98% on a non-rebreather, and temps 99.5. So just a quick look at this patient. Um, he's on a non-rebreather, satting 98, so he's in some distress. Um, you don't see any obvious signs of trauma, something you should always look for in stroke patients. If you become densely uh, hemiplegic, you're likely to fall. So something you should keep in mind. Um, and then we know that he has a forced right gaze. Uh, irregular heartbeat. He does have the history of atrial fibrillation. Lungs sound okay. Uh, we get some imaging. He's in the neuro ED. He gets expedited. He gets um, a CT, a CTA, and an MRI. And so we get the MRI results. And you can see here uh, this bright white section on the slice of MRI. So keep in mind the imaging is reversed. So what's on your left is actually the right, and what's on the right is the left. And so we see this very bright uh, portion on the right hand side here. And that's uh, unfortunately uh, this man's very sizable right MCA infarct. And so we know what's going on based on his scans, but we want to go through the neurologic exam here. So Ellie's going to walk us through um, a stroke scale. 